Chapter One of The Guards Came Through and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Guards Came Through and other poems by sir arthur conan doyle chapter one preface i must apologize for the size of this booklet which can only be justified on the grounds that there is some demand for the contents as recitations i hope presently to combine whatever is worth preserving in my three volumes of verse so as to make a single collection Arthur Conan Doyle The Guards Came Through Men of the Twenty-First, up by the chalk pit wood, Weak from our wounds and our thirst, Wanting our sleep and our food. After a day and a night, God, shall I ever forget, Beaten and broke in the fight, But sticking it, sticking it yet, Trying to hold the line, fainting and spent and done always the thud and the whine always the yell of the hun northumberland lancaster york durham and somerset fighting alone worn to the bone but sticking it sticking it yet never a message of hope never a word of cheer fronting hill seventies shell swept slope with the dull dead plain in our rear always the shriek of the shell always the roar of the burst always the tortures of hell as waiting and wincing we cursed our luck the guns in the batch when our corporal shouted stand to and i hear someone cry clear the front for the guards and the guards came through our throats they were parched and hot but lord if you'd heard the cheer irish welsh and scot cold stream and grenadier two brigades if you please dressing as straight as a hem we we were down on our knees praying for us and for them praying with tear-wet cheek praying with outstretched hand lord i could speak for a week but how could you understand how could your cheeks be wet such feelings don't come to you but how can me or my mates forget how the guards came through five yards left extend it passed from rank to rank and line after line with never a bend in a touch of the london swank a trifle of swank and dash cool as a home parade twinkle glitter and flash flinching never a shade with the shrapnel right in their face doing their hyde park stunt swinging along at an easy pace arms at the trail eyes front man it was great to see man it was great to do it's a cot and a hospital ward for me but I'll tell them in Blighty, wherever I be, how the guards came through. End of chapter one. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter two. Victrix by Arthur Conan Doyle. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Victrix. How was it then with England? Her faith was true to her plighted word. Her strong hand closed on her blunted sword. Her heart rose high to the foeman's hate. She walked with God on the hills of fate and all was well with england how was it then with england her soul was wrung with loss and pain her face was gray 
with her heart's blood drain but her falcon eyes were hard and bright austere and cold as an ice cave's light and all was well with england how was it then with england little she said to foe or friend true heart true to the uttermost end her passion cry was the scathe she wrought in flame and steel she voiced her thought and all was well with england how was it then with england with drooping sword and bended head she turned apart and mourned her dead sad sky above sad earth beneath she walked with god in the vale of death ah woe the day for england how is it now with england she sees upon her mist-girt path dim drifting shapes of fear and wrath hold high the heart bend low the knee she has been guided and will be and all is well with england end of poem this recording is in the public domain those others by arthur conan doyle read for LibriVox.org by ken masters where are those others the men who stood in the first wild spate of the german flood and paid full price with their heart's best blood for the saving of you and me french's contemptibles haggard and lean allenby's lads of the cavalry screen gunners who fell in battery l and guardsmen of landrazy where are those others who fought and fell out manned out gunned and scant of shell on the deadly curve of the ypres hell barring the coast to the last where are our laddies who died out there from pool capella to festubert when the days grew short and the poplars bare in the cold november blast for us their toil and for us their pain the sordid ditch in the sodden plain the flemish fog and the driving rain the cold that cramped and froze the weary night the chill bleak day when earth was dark and sky was grey and the ragged weeds in the dripping clay were all god's world to those where are those others in this glad time when the standards wave and the joy bells chime and london stands with outstretched hands waving her children in athwart our joy still comes the thought of the dear dead boys whose lives have bought all that sweet victory has brought to us who lived to win to each his dreams and mine to me but as the shadows fall i see that ever glorious company the men who bide out there rifleman highlander fusilier airman and sapper and grenadier with flaunting banner and wave and cheer they flow through the darkening air and yours are there and so are mine rank upon rank and line on line with smiling lips and eyes that shine and bearing proud and high past they go with their measured tread these are the victors these the dead ah sink the knee and bear the head as the hallowed host goes by End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Haig is Moving by Arthur Conan Doyle. Read for LibriVox.org by Ken Masters. 
August 1918 Hague is moving. Three plain words are all that matter Mid the gossip and the chatter. Hopes in speeches, fears in papers, Pessimistic froth and vapours. Hague is moving. Hague is moving. We can turn from German scheming, from humanitarian dreaming, from assertions, contradictions, twisted facts and solemn fictions. Hague is moving. Hague is moving. All the weary idle phrases, empty blamings, empty praises. Here's an end to their recital. There is only one thing vital. Hague is moving. Hague is moving. He is moving, he is gaining, and the whole hushed world is straining, straining, yearning for the vision of the doom and the decision. Hague is moving. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Guns in Sussex by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Ken Masters Light green of grass and richer green of bush Slope upward to the darkest green of fir. How still, how deathly still! And yet the hush shivers and trembles with some subtle stir some far-off throbbing like a muffled drum beaten in broken rhythm over sea to play the last funeral march of some who die today that europe may be free the deep blue heaven curving from the green spans with its shimmering arch the flowery zone in all god's earth there is no gentler scene and yet i hear that awesome monotone above the circling midges piping shrill and the long droning of the questing bee above all sultry summer sounds it still mutters its ceaseless menaces to me and as i listen all the garden fair darkens to plains of misery and death and looking past the roses i see there those sordid furrows with the rising breath of all things foul and black my heart is hot within me as i view it and i cry better the misery of these men's lot than all the peace that comes to such as i and strange that in the pauses of the sound i hear the children's laughter as they roam and then their mother calls and all around rise up the gentle murmurs of a home but still i gaze afar and at the sight my whole soul softens to its heartfelt prayer spirit of justice thou for whom they fight ah turn in mercy to our lads out there the froward peoples have deserved thy wrath and on them is the judgment as of old but if they wandered from the hallowed path yet is their retribution manifold Behold, all Europe writhing on the rack, the sins of fathers grinding down the sons. How long, O oh Lord? He sends no answer back, but still I hear the mutter of the guns. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Ippers by Arthur Conan Doyle. Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano.
Newport Ritchie, Florida. Ippers, September, 1915. Push on, my lord of Württemberg, across the Flemish fen. See where the lore of Ippers calls you. There's just one ragged British line of plumers, weary men. It's true they held you off before, but venture it again. Come, try your luck, whatever fate befalls you. You've been some little time, my lord, perhaps you scarce remember. The far-off early days of that resistance, was it in October last, or was it in November? And now the leaves are turning, and you stand in mid-September, still staring at the belfry in the distance. Can you recall the fateful day, a day of drifting skies, when you started on the famous Calais onset? Can it be the warlord blundered when he urged the enterprise? For surely it's a weary while since first before your eyes that old belfry rose against the sunset. You held council at your quarters when the budding Alexanders and the pickle-hobbed Caesars gave their reasons. Was there one amongst that bristle-headed circle of commanders ever ventured the opinion that a little town of Flanders would hold you pounded here through all the seasons? You all clasped hands upon it, you would break the British line. You would smash a road to westward with your host. The howitzers should thunder, and the Yulin lances shine, till Calais heard the blaring of the distant Wacht am Rhein. As you topped the grassy uplands of the coast, said the Graf von Fauressen, it's a fact beyond discussion that man to man we can outfight the foe. There is valor in the French, there is patience in the Russian, but blend all warlike virtues, and you get the lordly Prussian. And the bristle headed murmured, Dossest so, and the British cried another, They are mercenary cattle, without one noble impulse of the soul, degenerate and drunken, if the dollars chink and rattle, tis the only sort of music that will call them to the battle. And all the bristle-headed cried, Ya vol! And so next day your battle rolled across the men in plain, where Capper's men stood lonely to your wrath. You broke him, and you broke him, but you broke him all in vain, for he and his contemptibles kept closing up again. And the khaki bar was still across your path, and on the day when Gelevolt lay smoking in the sun, when von Daimling stormed so hotly in the van, you smiled as Haig reeled backwards, and you thought him on the run. But alas for dreams that vanish, for before the day was done, it was you, my lord of Württemberg, that ran. A dreary day was that, but another came more dreary, when the guard from Arras led your fierce attacks. Spruce and splendid in the morning were the Potsdam grenadier, but not so spruce that evening when they staggered spent and weary. With those cursed British storming at their backs, you knew, your spies had told you, that the ranks were scant and thin, that the guns were short of shell and very few, by all Bernhardi's maxims you are surely bound to win. There's the open town before you. Haste, my lord, and enter in, or the warlord may have telegrams for you. Then came the rainy winter, when the price was ever dearer. Every time you neared the prize of which you dreamed, each day the belfry faced you, but you never brought it nearer. Each night you saw it clearly, but you never saw it clearer. Ah, what a weary time it must have seemed. At last there came the Easter, when you loosed the coward gases. Surely you have got the rascals now. You could see them spent and choking as you watched them through your glasses. 
Yes, they choke, but never waver, and again the moment passes, without one leaf of laurel for your brow. Then at Hooge you had them helpless, for their guns were one to ten, and you blasted trench and traverse at your will. You had them dead and buried, but they still sprang up again. Donner Vetter, cried your lordship, Donner Vetter, cried your men, for their very ghosts were guarding Ipper still. Active, guards, reserve, men of every corps and name, that the bugles of the warlord muster in. Each in turn you tried them, but the story was the same. Play it how you would, my lord, you never won the game. No, never in a twelvemonth did you win. A year, my lord of Württemberg, a year, or nearly so, since first you faced the British vis-a-vis. -vis. You learned commandanten are the men who ought to know, but to ordinary mortals it would seem a trifle slow. If you really mean to travel to the sea, if you cannot straff the British, since they are straffing you so well, you can safely smash the town that lies so near. So it's down with arch and buttress, down with belfry and with bell, and it's hook the seven-seven that can drop the petrol shell. On the shrines that pious hands have loved to rear, fair Ippers was a relic of the soul of other days. A poet's dream, a wanderer's delight, we will keep it as a symbol of your brute Teutonic ways, that millions yet unborn may come and curse you as they gaze at this token of your impotence and spite for shame my lord of Württemberg, across the flemish fen see where the little army calls you it's just the old familiar line of fifty thousand men they've beat you once or twice my lord but venture it again come try your luck whatever fate befalls you End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Grousing by Arthur Conan Doyle. Read for LibriVox.org by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The army swore terribly in Flanders. Uncle Toby. What do the soldiers say? Damn, damn, damn! I don't mind cold, I don't mind heat, Over the top for a Sunday treat, With Fritz I'll always take my spell, But I want my grub, and where in hell is the jam? What does the officer say? Damn, damn, damn! Mud and misery, flies and stench, Pigging it here in a beastly trench, But what I mean by Jove, you see, I like my men, and they don't mind me, so, on the whole, I'd rather be where I am. What does the enemy say? Colossal Vertam! They told me, when the war began, the British Tommy always ran, and so he does, just as they said. But don't her fetter, it's straight ahead, like a ram. What does the public say? Damn, damn, damn! They tax me here, they tax me there. Bread is dear and the cupboard bare. I'm bound to grouse, but if it's the way to win the war, why, then I'll pay like a lamb. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Volunteer by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Jairus Amar The dreams are past and gone, old man, that came to you and me, of a six-day stunt on an east coast front, and the Hun with his back to the sea. Lord, how we worked and swatted sore, to be fit when the day should come. Four years, my lad, and five months more, since first we followed the drum. Though follow the drum is a bit too grand, for we ran to no such frills. It was just the whistles of nature's band that heartened us up the hills. 
that and the toot of the corporal's flute until he could blow no more and the lilt of sussex by the sea the marching song of the corps those hills my word you would soon get fit be you ever so stale and slack if you pat it with the rifle and marching kit to rotherfield hill and back drills in hall and drills outdoors and drills of every type till we wore our boots with forming fours and our coats with shoulder hype no glory hours no swank no pay one dull eventless grind find yourself and nothing a day were the terms that the old boy signed just drill and march and drill again and swat at the old parade but they got two hundred thousand men not bad for the old brigade a good two hundred thousand came on the chance of that east coast fight they may have been old and stiff and lame but by george their hearts were right discipline my eyes right they cried as we passed the drill hall door and left it at that so we marched cock-eyed from three to half past four and solid why after a real wet bout in the hole in the flanders mud it would puzzle the bosch to fetch us out for we couldn't get out if we would some think we could have stood war's test some say that we could not but a chap can only do his best and offer all he's got fall out the guard the old home guard pile arms right turn dismiss no grousing even if it's hard to break our ranks like this we can't show much in the way of fun for four and a half years gone if we'd have our chance just one just one carry on old sport carry on end of poem this recording is in the public domain the night patrol by arthur conan doyle read for LibriVox.org by september nineteen eighteen Behind me on the darkened pier, they crowd and chatter, man and maid. A coon song gently strikes the ear, a flapper giggles in the shade. There, where the interned lantern gleams, it shines on khaki and on brass. Across its yellow slanting beams, the arm locked lovers slowly pass out in the darkness one far light throbs like a pulse and fades away some signal on the guarded white from helen's point to pembridge bay an eastern wind blows chill and raw cheerless and black the waters lie and as i gaze athwart the haze i see the night patrol go by creeping shadows blur the gloom Thicken and darken, pass and fade. Again and yet again they loom, One ruby spark above each shade. Twelve ships in all. They glide so near. One hears the wave, the forefoot curled, And yet to those upon the pier They seem some other, sterner world. The coon song whimpers to a wail, the treble laughter sinks and dies. The lovers cluster on the rail with whispered words and straining eyes. One hush of awe, and then once more the vision fades for them and me, and there is laughter on the shore and silent duty on the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wreck on Loch McGarry by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina If you should search all Scotland round, the mainland, Skerries, and the islands, a grimmer spot could not be found than Loch McGarry in the highlands. Pent in by frowning mountains high, it stretches silent as the tomb, turbid and thick its waters lie no eye can pierce their yellow gloom 
"'Twas here that on a summer day four tourists hired a crazy wherry. No warning voices bade them stay as they pushed out on Loch McGarry. McFarlane, chairman of the board, a grim, hard-fisted son of lucre. His thoughts were ever on his hoard, and life a money-game, like euchre. Bob Ainsley, late of London town, a spruce young butterfly of fashion, a wrinkle in his dressing-gown would rouse an apoplectic passion. John Waters, John, the self-absorbed, with thoughts forever inward bent, complacent, self-contained, self-orbed, wrapped in eternal self-content. Lastly, coquettish Mrs. Wild, chattering, rowdy, empty-headed, at sight of her the whole world smiled, except the wretch whom she had wedded. Such were the four who sailed that day, to the highlands each a stranger. Sunlit and calm the wide loch lay, with not a hint of coming danger. Drifting they watched the heather hue, the waters and the cliffs that bound them. The air was still, the sky was blue, deceitful peace lay all around them. McFarlane pondered on the stocks, John Waters on his own perfection. Bob Ainsley's thoughts were on his socks, and Mrs. Wilde's on her complexion. When sudden, oh, that dreadful scream, that cry from panic fear begotten! The boat is gaping in each seam, the worn-out planks are old and rotten. With two small oars they work and strain, a long mile from the nearer shore. They cease. Their efforts are in vain. She's sinking fast, and all is o'er. The yellow water, thick as pap, is crawling, crawling to the thwarts. As they mark its upward lap, so fear goes crawling up their hearts. Slowly, slowly, thick as pap, the creeping yellow waters rise like drowning mice within a trap they stare around with frantic eyes ah how clearly they could see every sin and shame and error how they vowed that saints they'd be if delivered from this terror how they squirmed and how they squealed how they shouted for assistance how they fruitlessly appealed to the shepherds in the distance how they sobbed, and how they moaned, as the waters kept encroaching! How they wept and stormed and groaned, as they saw their fate approaching! And they vowed each good resolve should be permanent as granite, never, never to dissolve, firm and lasting like our planet. See them sit, aghast and shrinking, Surely it could not be true. Oh, have mercy! Oh, we're sinking! Oh, good Lord, what shall we do? Ah, it's coming. Now she founders. See the crazy wherry reel. Downward to the rock she flounders, just one foot beneath her keel. In the shallow, turbid water lay the saving reef below. Oh, the waste of high emotion! Oh, the useless fear and woe! Late that day, four sopping tourists to their quarters made their way, and the brushes of futurists scarce could paint their disarray, and with half amused compassion they were viewed from the hotel, from the pulp clad bow of fashion to the saturated bell but a change was in their features and that change has come to tarry for they all are altered creatures since the wreck of loch mcgarry now mcfarlane never utters any talk of bills or bullion but continually mutters texts from cyril or tertullian as to ainsley he's not caring how the new-cut collar lies and has been detected wearing dinner-jackets with white ties. Waters, who had never thought in his life of others' needs, 
has most generously bought a nursing home for invalids. And the lady, ah, the lady, she has turned from paths of sin, and her husband's face so shady now is brightened by a grin. So misfortunes of to-day are the blessings of to-morrow, and the wisest cannot say what is joy and what is sorrow. If your soul is arable, you can start this seed within it, and my tiny parable may just help you to begin it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Bigot by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson In Hazelmere, Surrey The Bigot The foolish Roman fondly thought that gods must be the same to all. Each alien idol might be brought within their broad pantheon hall the vision of a jealous jove was far above their feeble ken they had no lord who gave them love but scowled upon all other men but in our dispensation bright what noble progress have we made we know that we are in the light and outer races in the shade our kindly creed ensures us this that Turk and infidel and Jew are safely banished from the bliss that's guaranteed to me and you. The Roman mother understood that if the babe upon her breast untimely died, the gods were good and the child's welfare manifest. With tender guides the soul would go, and there in some Elysian bower the tiny bud plucked here below would ripen to the perfect flower <laughs> poor simpleton our faith makes plain that if no blessed baptismal word has cleared the babe it bears the stain which faithless adam had incurred how philosophical an aim how wise and well-conceived a plan which holds the new-born babe to blame for all the sins of early man nay speak not of its tender grace but hearken to our dogma wise guilt lies behind that dimpled face and sin looks out from gentle eyes quick quick the water and the bowl quick with the words that lift the load oh hasten ere that tiny soul shall pay the debt old adam owed the roman thought that souls that erred would linger in some nether gloom but somewhere some time would be spared to find some peace beyond the tomb in those dark halls enshadowed vast they flitted ever sad and thin mourning the unforgotten past until they shed the taint of sin and pluto brooded over all within that land of night and fear enthroned in some dark judgment hall a god himself reserved austere how thin and colourless and tame compare our nobler scheme with it the howling souls the leaping flame and all the tortures of the pit <laughs> foolish half-hearted roman hell to us is left the higher thought of that eternal torture cell whereto the sinner shall be brought out with the thought that god could share our weak relenting pity sense or ever condescend to spare the wretch who gave him just offence 
tis just ten thousand years ago since the vile sinner left his clay and yet no pity can he know for as he lies in hell to-day so when ten thousand years have run still shall he lie in endless night o god of love o holy one have we not read thy ways aright the godly man in heaven shall dwell and live in joy before the throne though somewhere down in nether hell his wife or children writhe and groan from his bright empyrean height he sees the reek from that abyss oh, what pagan ever dreamed a sight so holy and sublime as this poor foolish folk had they begun to weigh the myths that they professed one hour of reason and each one would surely stand a fraud confessed pretending to believe each deed of theseus or of hercules with fairy tales of ganymede and gods of rocks and gods of trees no no had they our purer light they would have learned some saner tale of balaam's ass or samson's might or prophet jonah and his whale <laughs> of talking serpents and their ways through which our foolish parents strayed and how there passed three nights and days before the sun or moon was made o oh, bigotry you crowning sin all evil that a man can do has earthly bounds nor can begin to match the mischief done by you you who would force the source of love to play your small sectarian part and mould the mercy from above to fit your own contracted heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain the athabasca trail by arthur conan doyle read for LibriVox.org by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina my life is gliding downwards it speeds swifter to the day when it shoots the last dark canyon to the plains of far away but while its stream is running through the years that are to be the mighty voice of canada will ever call to me i shall hear the roar of rivers where the rapids foam and tear i shall smell the virgin upland with its balsam laden air and shall dream that i am riding down the winding woody vale with the packer and the pack-horse on the athabasca trail i have passed the warden cities at the eastern water-gate where the hero and the martyr laid the cornerstone of state the habitant coureur des bois and hardy voyageur where lives a breed more strong at need to venture or endure i have seen the gorge of erie where the roaring waters run i have crossed the inland ocean lying golden in the sun but the last and best and sweetest is the ride by hill and dale with the packer and the packhorse on the athabasca trail i'll dream again of fields of grain that stretch from sky to sky and the little prairie hamlets where the cars go roaring by wooden hamlets as i saw them noble cities still to be to girdle stately canada with gems from sea to sea mother of a mighty manhood land of glamour and of hope from the eastward sea-swept islands to the sunny western slope evermore my heart is with you evermore till life shall fail i'll be out with pack and packer on the athabasca trail end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Ragtime by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Anusha Ayer During the catastrophe, the band of the Titanic played Negro melodies and ragtime until the last moment when they broke into a hymn. Daily Paper Ragtime, ragtime, keep it going still. Let them hear the ragtime, play it with a will women in the lifeboats men upon the wreck take heart to hear the ragtime lilting down the deck ragtime ragtime yet another tune now the darky dandy now the yellow coon brace against the bulwarks if the stands askew find your footing as you can but keep the music true there's glowing hell beneath us where the shattered boilers roar the ship is listing and awash the boats will hold no more there's nothing more that you can do and nothing you can mend only keep the rat time playing to the end don't forget the time boys eyes upon the score never heed the wavelets sobbing down the floor Play it as you played it when with eager feet a hundred pair of dancers were stamping to the beat. Stamping to the rag time down the lamplit deck with shine of glossy linen and with gleam of snowy neck. They've other thoughts to think tonight and other things to do, but the tinkle of the rag time may help to see them through. Shut off shut off the rack time the lights are falling low the deck is buckling under us she's sinking by the bow one hymn of hope from dying hands on dying ears to fall gently the music fades away and so god rest us all end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Christmas in Wartime by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Christmas in Wartime, 1916 cheer o oh, comrades we can bide the blast and face the gloom until it shall grow lighter what through one christmas shall be overcast if duty done makes all the others brighter nineteen seventeen the last lap we seldom were quick off the mark and sprinting was never our game but when it's insistence and hold for the distance we've never been beat at that same the first lap was all to the hun at the second we still saw his back but we knew how to wait and to spurt down the straight till we left him dead beat on the track he's a bluffer for all he is worth but he's winded and done to the core so the last lap is here with the tape very near and the old colors well to the fore not merry no the words would grate with gaps at every table side but chastened thankful calm sedate be your victorious christmas tide end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lindisfaire by Arthur Conan Doyle, read for LibriVox.org by Jordan Heron. Horses go down the dingy lane, but never a horse comes up again. The greasy yard where the red hides lie marks the place where the horses die. Wheat was sinking year by year. I bought things cheap, I sold them dear. Rent was heavy and taxes high, and a weary hearted man was I. In Lindisfaire, I walked my grounds, 
i hadn't the heart to ride to hounds and as i walked in black despair i saw my old bay hunter there he tried to nuzzle against my cheek he looked the grief he could not speak but no caress came back again for harder times make harder men my thoughts were sent on stable rent on money saved and money spent on weekly bills for forage lost and all the old bay hunter cost for though a flyer in the past his days of service long were past his gait was stiff his eyes were dim and i could find no use for him i turned away with heart of gloom and sent for will my father's groom the old old groom whose worn-out face was like the fortune of our race i gave my order sharp and hard go ride him to the knacker's yard he'll fetch two pounds it may be three sell him and bring the price to me i saw the old groom wince away he looked the thoughts he dared not say then from his fob he slowly drew a leather pouch of faded hue master said he my means are small this purse of leather holds them all but i have neither kith nor kin i'll pay your price for prince's skin my brother rents the nether farm and he will hold him safe from harm in the great field where he may graze and see the finish of his days with dimming eyes i saw him stand two pounds were in his shaking hand i gave a curse to drown the sob and thrust the purse within his fob may god do this and more to me if we should ever part we three master and horse and faithful friend we'll share together to the end you'll think i'm playing it on you i give my word the thing is true i hadn't hardly made the vow before i heard of you halloo and looking round whom should i see but bookie johnson hailing me johnson the man who bilked the folks when ethelrida won the oaks he drew a wad from out his vest here are a thousand of the best luck's turned a bit with me of late and as you see i'm getting straight that's all my luck was turning too if you have nothing else to do run down some day to lindisfair you'll find the old bay hunter there end of poem this recording is in the public domain a parable by arthur conan doyle read for LibriVox.org by roslyn carlyle a parable highbrow house was furnished well with many a goblet fair so when they brought the holy grail there was never a space to spare simple cottage was clear and clean with room to store it well so there they laid the holy grail and there you'll find it still end of poem this recording is in the public domain Fate by Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Jule Niedermeyer I know not how I know, and yet I know. I do not plan to go, and yet I go. There is some dim force propelling, gently guiding and compelling, and a faint voice ever telling, this is so. The path is rough and black, dark as night, And there lies a fairer track in the light. Yet I may not shirk or shrink, For I feel the hands that link, As they guide me on the brink of the height. Bigots blame me in their wrath, Let them blame. Praise or blame the fated path is the same. If I droop upon my mission, there is still that saving vision, iridescent and elysian, tipped in flame. It was granted me to stand by my dead. I have felt the vanished hand on my head, on my brow the vanished lips, and I know that death's eclipse is a floating veil that slips or is shed. When I heard thy well-known voice, son of mine, 
Should I silently rejoice or incline to strike harder as a fighter, that the heavy might be lighter and the gloomy might be brighter at the sign? Great guide, I ask you still, wherefore I? But if it be thy will that I try, trace my pathway among men, show me how to strike and when, take me to the fight and then, oh, be nigh. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of The Guards Came Through and Other Poems by Arthur Conan Doyle